So the title of our presentation is Using Unmanned Aerial Systems, also known as drones, to measure NOx emissions from stationary sources. My name is Patrick Clark. I'm with Montrose Air Quality Services. I'm the Vice President of Ambient Measurement Services and Emerging Technology. My co-author is Jennifer Richardson of the Dow Chemical Corporation. A little bit of background, stack testing, what is it? Uh, stack testing is also known as source testing, and we're essentially measuring the amount of a regulated pollutant being emitted from a stack, vent, or source. Uh, some pictures of stack testing and what it looks like. Lower left-hand corner, you see a crew working out of a man lift, measuring particulate emissions from that stack. Lower right corner, we were doing some uh, testing in Bahrain, and that gentleman is working on about 180 feet of scaffolding. Uh, the picture in the upper right is a plant worker who was uh, taking off some test ports for us. You can see he has no harness on, and if he steps back about 10 feet, there's about a 75-foot drop. So the motivation for Dow Chemical and the use of drones uh, to measure stack emissions was really to reduce the hazard of having crews working at heights. Uh, if you look at some of the statistics in 2018, there are nearly 800 fatalities uh, from falls, nearly 200,000 falls in total that were reported to OSHA. And what often is forgotten in the field of stack testing is that uh, going to and from the work site is probably the most hazardous part of it. Uh, oftentimes we're pulling trailers that have chemicals and compressed gases in them and just driving in itself is a, is a risk. What do some of these stack testing incidents look like? Uh, upper right hand corner obviously that's a, uh, a vehicle accident. Uh, fortunately nobody was hurt but you could see the, uh, the trailer rolled a couple of times while it was still attached to our truck. Lower left hand corner is a flow measurement device that was being raised to a stack location. Uh, the rope came undone and it fell about 75 feet. The lower right hand corner is an elevator at a coal fired power plant. Um, the motor is powered through some cables that generally track beneath the elevator. The cables became entangled and uh, as we were going down uh, the elevator, uh, essentially just uh, jammed itself on the uh, the cables. Uh, I happened to be in that elevator with a uh, brand new just out of school field technician. We were stuck up there for about an hour in a hundred degree heat. Um, uh, eventually they got some harnesses up to us. We were able to go out the roof of the elevator, swing over to a ladder and, and climb down safely. So the question is, how do you minimize the inherent risks of stack testing? And, and one of the possible solutions that Dow uh, thought might address this is the use of drones. So they did a first proof of concept study with the uh, EPA and the University of Dayton uh, that was at the Dow Midland, Michigan facility back in November of 2018. That was a success. So last year, uh, the same team, along with Montrose, uh, conducted a simulated relative accuracy test audit on two gas boilers in uh, Louisiana in July of 2019. Uh, what a RADA, relative accuracy test audit, or RADA, is uh, what we're doing is comparing uh, the facility continuous emission monitoring system uh, to the reference method, and the reference method is operated by a testing crew. So we essentially had two data set or three data sets if you include the drones. We had the continuous emission monitoring system, the reference method testers, and then our drone package. Uh, with Arata, you're typically doing nine to 12 test runs. Uh, each test run is 21 minutes in length, and the requirement is a 20% relative accuracy. So the RADA is generally conducted in units of pounds per million BTU on gas boilers. Um, what we did was make a measurement in the plume using the drone package for CO2 and CO, the principal carbon species, and then uh, NO and NO2, which added together is the NOx. Uh, initially, we'd make a CO2 background measurement, subtract that from the plume CO2. 
Uh, at the same time, we'd measure the fuel flow rate during the test period and collect uh, natural gas fuel samples to measure the carbon content and the heat content. So with the plume measurement, you're, you're, you can calculate an emission factor in units of mass NOx per mass carbon. So you can calculate the NOx emission rate then from the emission factor and then the fuel flow rate and the carbon content of the fuel flow rate. So we now have a NOx emission rate in pounds per hour. So to get your pounds per million BTU, you take that pounds per hour and then divide it basically by the, uh, the heat input, which uh, is based off the fuel flow rate and the heat content of the fuel flow. So the equipment used was uh, developed by EPA and the University of Dayton. Uh, the, you can see a picture of the sensor package on the upper right and then the individual sensors below it. The CO2 sensor was manufactured by Sensair. It's a NDIR uh, sensor. And then the other three were electrochemical sensors for uh, CO, NO, and NO2 manufactured by Sensor Tech and AlphaSense. The enclosure itself had a, a small sample pump and was uh, uh, constructed out of a lightweight carbon fiber. Uh, it had uh, places to connect batteries in two spots so you can do a hot swap of the batteries as they had to be replaced so you didn't have to power down the sensors. And then data was communicated from the sensor package to the ground via remote telemetry. The drone itself was a six-rotor multi-copter. It was a DGI matrix, matrix 600 UAS. Uh, weight with batteries was 22 kilograms. Uh, maximum takeoff weight was 34 kilograms. Flight time around 20 minutes, which gets us uh, right to where we need to be for those 20-21 minute runs. You can see a picture on the left of the Dow Chemical flight team and then a uh, Kind of a closer picture of the drone with the sensor package uh, strapped underneath it. And then in the upper right hand corner of that picture, you could see the two boiler stacks. Uh, we're going to make measurements. Sensors were calibrated with EPA proto uh, protocol calibration gases. And if you look at that picture on the right, um, you can see the sensor pick package at the bottom and then uh, the small size of the canisters required. Uh, you could see in terms of equipment needed and transporting that equipment uh, a lot less than traditional stack testing. So essentially the picture on the lower left is the data acquisition system and the, the sampler technician was co-located with the drone pilot. Uh, the drone would be measured uh, towards the plume and we'd observe the CO2 levels and the temperature levels and when we started to see uh, elevated readings we knew we were in the plume and then we would start a test run. So after the first day of sampling uh, we, we realized we had challenges with finding the the plume. Uh, part of the problem is the two boilers were fairly close to each other uh, the distance away we were from the plumes and then even other sources at the facility. So after the first day of sampling, Dow was able to get a, a second drone and an infrared camera. Uh, we put the infrared camera on the drone and uh, pointed it at our sampler drone. And you can see from the screenshot, it's a little hard to see, but on the right is the, um, the stack we were testing. Uh, you can see where the plume is a darkly shaded area. And then just to the left of that, uh, you can see kind of the hazy image of the drone with the sensors and uh, using that technique um, along with the CO2 measurements, we're able to better locate the drone in the plume. And you can see this in the CO2 data. This is day one on the east stack. Um, you can see the spikes are when we we're in the plume and uh, you can see all the times the wind shifted and the, the sampler package was not in the plume itself. Day two, uh, same type of plot. Um, you, you, could, you could see we have higher readings of CO2 and we're in the plume a lot more than day one. 
So at the beginning of the day, we calibrated the sensors, and then at the end of the day, we calibrated them again. Typically, when you're doing a RATA, you calibrate after every 21-minute 20 run, um, or at least after every three runs. Uh, we went the whole day. And at the end of the day, calibrated everything, as, in, as you can see from these tables. Uh, there's very minimal drift of all the sensors for the two days. Uh, really great performance, considering um, it was a hot, muggy day in Louisiana. Uh, EPA requirements are five, no more than 5% drift, um, and all of the sensors uh, met that requirement. Kind of what some of the data looks like in terms of the emission factors in uh, milligrams NOx per kilogram carbon. And uh, one of the takeaways from this graph, this is day one. Uh, we were only able to get in five runs, uh, but if you look in the right-hand column, the CO2 levels range from Oh, anywhere from under 1,000 to uh, 2,500 ppm. Uh, keep in mind, we're subtracting a background that uh, uh, was approximately 400 ppm. Day two, when we had the infrared camera, you look in that far right column, uh, and you can see we have much higher CO2 readings, uh, some as high as um, nearly 5,000 ppm. Day two, we had a little bit better start, and we are actually able to get in a full nine runs of uh, sampling in. So this is what a RADA table looks like. Again, for the calculations, uh, you use nine to 12 runs for, so this is day one. So I basically took our five runs and copied them down again, which is why you see 10 runs. Uh, the column marked SIMS was the plant continuous emission monitoring system with units in pounds per million BTU, an average of 0.069. And then the drone to the left of that, um, again, in pounds per million BTU with an average of 0.071, ended up with a, a relative accuracy of 14.3%, which met the EPA requirement of 20. Day two, uh, similar results, uh, different source, uh, the SIMS, uh, average pounds per million BTU was 0.058, and then the drone sensor package uh, average emission of 0.062 pounds per million BTU and a relative accuracy of 12.2%, which again met the EPA requirement. So some of the conclusions and recommendations. Um, you know, one of the pleasant surprises was uh, just how stable the sensors were. Uh, after five hours of operation, they were all still spot on. Uh, the second drone with the infrared camera helped uh, with the locating of the sensor package in the plume. Further validation of the data is in process. We, sent, we found some anomalies uh, in the results uh, that we're looking into right now. We just need to... Uh, make sure our data is correct before we move on to the next step. Um, we'd like to update the telemetry software package. Uh, some of the sensors we were able to see results in PPM, but some were still uh, just in a, a voltage output of the sensor. Um, so we, we'd like to get that cleaned up so that next time we could download data in real time and really evaluate the data uh, when we're making measurements. So. We think this shows promise um, for possibly moving forward with an alternative test method for determining stack emissions. So the next step uh, may be alternative test method and method 301 validation. Although at this point in time, I think we're going to do one more demonstration test uh, with some revised procedures uh, towards the end of the year. So all the credit for the study goes to the to really Brian Gullett and Johanna Orell. Uh, they're with EPA and the University of Dayton Research Institute. They developed the sensor package as well as the telemetry system. And of course, my co-author, Jennifer Richardson with Dow Chemical Company, who was the really the main drivers behind evaluating uh, drones as an alternative test method for measuring stack emissions. And then of course, the Dow flight team, who was uh, just a pleasure to work with uh, real professionals uh, and did a great job of flying the drones. And with that, I will thank you for your time.